We'll just start with one here. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us this conversation and this chance to you done who you are. May we understand your grace, your mind, and follow our hearts. We entrust this conversation to you through our mother as we say. Hail. Amen. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we have some new word to summarize what we talked about in the last few articles. Um, this is John Paul II's letter to the church on moral truth. How to live your life by right way, what's right and wrong, what these things are. And he's writing in response to various trends that sort of popping up in the 70s and 80s. And unfortunately, haven't gone away. Um, they've resurfaced in the last few years. Um, and so he's basically trying to answer a couple of things. And, and first of all, there's the question of living in a pluralist society, living in, in a place, a time, um, <coughs> where everybody is Christian, while everybody believes the same things, while everybody understands the same stuff. Does the church have the right to tell everybody there is one truth? when it comes to the way we behave and we act. So this is one question he's trying to address. Then there's the question of um, what about situations? So there's, there's various different names, relativism, situation ethics, uh, different, different terms. But the, the main idea behind all these different conglomerate is that right and wrong is, is, is different depending on the circumstances, depending on who I am, depending on who I'm with, depending on what's going on, depending on various things. So different situations will make things good or bad. So there's no objective truth of me on the situation. There's just right now, maybe lying is bad. Maybe it's not bad at times. Right now, adultery is wrong. It might not be wrong in other situations. He's also another one of these things he's trying to address is, and you can find it in different names, but proportionalism is one of them. And the most simplistic way you'll see it all the time nowadays is, well, as long as I love, as long as I'm basically a good person, I can do whatever I want. So, yes, I was living around my girlfriend, but I love her. Yes, I was contraceptive, but basically I'm a good person, so this is okay. Because there's a good reason for it, you know, my overall lifestyle, like I do good for people, you know, so there's, this is trying to do us. And he begins with a reflection on the story of Matthew 19 of the rich young man. And basically what he said, and I'm summarizing it briefly, he says, we're all made from heaven for God. And Christ is the one who comes down from heaven to show us the way to get there. Because we're all made for heaven and for God. There's only one truth. And right and wrong is not going to change. And we're all made to follow our Lord. And not only right and wrong, good and bad, are following Jesus. And because that's what our goal is, and that's how we be happy, that's how we live the right way, then yes, the church only has the right to do to tell people what's good and bad. Know the situation does not change what's good or bad, because it's about following Christ when he is an objective person. And know there's not a difference in you know, as long as you're basically loving, because if you're doing anything wrong in Wicked, you aren't following Christ. Um, and so from here, that is basically basic. Reflection beforehand. And now in the second chapter, it's the we'll start at about 28, he's going to address some of these thoughts and address some of these confusions more directly. So the title for this chapter, he takes from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be informed of the world, right? because our goal is the world. 
It's really easy for us human beings to say, well, everybody else is doing it. But mom, <laughs> we don't go for it, right? I mean, well, but, but I, I know that the television I'm watching and it's all on TV is bad, but it's all that's out, but it's okay that I watch film like. Oh, I know that, you know, I should wear a mask on Sunday, but that will mean I'll get behind in my work and I'll lose you know, a career opportunity. So therefore, I can work on Sundays. Right, I can skip matches on her for a film in life. But we're not supposed to be conformed, we're supposed to be conformed to Christ, not to the world, not to society. So this is a church, and it has started to figure out certain tendencies in present day moral theology. Moral theology is a fancy word for the study of good and bad. Right and wrong. From Titus chapter 2, teach what befits sound doctrine. Article 28. A meditation on the dialogue of Jesus, a rich young man, has enabled us to bring together the essential elements of the Revelation and the Old Testament with regard to moral action. These are John Paul II is going to give us a summary of what the scriptures say about what was right. So it's a list here. So this is what Revelation says. It says that was Revelation about moral action. Subordination to God. Subordination to man's activity to God. The one alone is good. To the relationship indicated in the divine commandments between God and man and the God and man and each other. Relationship between moral good and eternal life. Christian discipleship. Comes up before men, respect of perfect love. And find the gift of the Holy Spirit, which enables the source to mean the moral life of the creation. So, what he said is he's saying that there's four things that Scripture teaches us, basically, there's four essential elements of the mind. The first is, Everything we do, everything we are, belongs to God, so it is back to God. God is not our tool or our servant, we belong to Him as you toward Him. Secondly, the reason why doing good or bad is important is that to get to heaven. <coughs> don't do, you don't do good, you're not imitating the Christ, you don't have a relationship with our Lord, you're not, not going to be close to Him, and they can't go to heaven. You live in a, in a good way, a relationship with our Lord, you're going to heaven. Three, specifically, we have that because God became man, we're not simply followers, disciples of any kind of good loss or any kind of right or wrong, we're followers of a person, Christ. We became man and taught us to show us how to live. And so we're here to learn how to be like him, to imitate him, and to, to said elsewhere in the Gospel of John, to be like the Master. That everything in the end is about becoming like Christ. Thanks for preaching that this weekend. <laughs> Uh, and finally, the only way we show how to do it, God Himself gives the grace and the means to do this way. It's not just simply God saying, "Well, do these things and good luck." I'm going to help you. I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to give you all you need to be able to do this as I do. So this then is what John the Second says: the basic elements of, of the moral life. In her reflection on morality, there is always kept in mind the words of Jesus, the rich young man. The fault come following. Indeed, the sacred scripture remains the living and fruitful source of his moral thought. As second last Council of Council were called, the church is developed the gospel of the source of all saving truth and moral teaching. 
The Church of faith they preserved what the Word of God teaches, not only about truths which must be believed, but also about moral action. So you have to, you know, what you believe should, should reflect what you do. You go hand in hand. You can't separate those things. Please be God. She achieved a dogma development analogous to that which is taking place around the truth of faith. This is about the Holy Spirit who leads her into all truth, which has not ceased, because she ever ceased, probably the mystery of the, the Word incarnate, and in light the shed the mystery of man. What John is actually saying is the scripture is we're beginning with this. The script the scripture helps us know Christ. The truth contains words. Because what we're doing is not simply about believing certain truths. It's not scientific stuff. We're not, we're not here simply to, to memorize certain things. We'll be able to uh, know there's between allergens and allergens. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to follow someone. Mm-hmm. And that means not only simply knowing things, that's very important, but also living a certain way of becoming something. Becoming imitators and disciples of Christ. That's what we're doing here. Because if all we're doing is playing mind or memorizing cool facts, memorizing trivia about who God is, it doesn't change us. That sounds like that's all they do for us in catechism when we're kids. You memorize all this stuff, and then when you're grown up, you have to redo all this stuff and we get, in, get into it again. Like, <laughs> so you can actually learn it. <laughs> well, hopefully, yeah, I mean, that's why we're here. Okay, that. <laughs> but unfortunately, that it, it is a, a common complaint. Um, and. and, and um, some some people, yeah. I think nowadays, unfortunately, we get neither one <laughs> in many places. We neither have to have the memorized facts nor help live the right way. No. But that's another discussion. Sorry, I'm really like you off. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, Let's bring in another time. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're trying to follow Christ. We're trying to follow Christ. Mm-hmm. And this is important because of the fact that um, we live in a world which tries to say, let's go old fashioned. The Bible's so old fashioned. The Bible, we're, we're, we're smarter than that. We've run beyond that. And it'd be nice to say that members of the church or bishops or priests or mm-hmm. we're, we're immune to that. But we're not. We like, to, we like to be Christ, we like to be along the flow. And so very often people will say, oh, the Bible old fashioned, not really old fashioned. Therefore, I'll find a new source for teaching what's right and wrong. A new reason. We'll look, look for like, psychology, or we'll look for society, or we'll look for democracy, whatever it might be. Then we're not following Christ. The other thing I just want to mention real briefly is this term doctrine development, the development of doctrine. Because this is a very important term, which is a very important phrase, which, which is twisted, especially in the modern world. Uh, development of doctrine does not mean it used to be this way, but we're smart now, and now it's changed. Or God used to tell us this, but now we're grown up, we're now different, now it's, life's different, now God tells us this. That's not development, that's a change. What is development? Something grows. What remains what it used to be. So a, a oak tree stays an oak tree. And so we plant the acorn and we grow this little sapling, the mighty oak. It doesn't stop being oak, look at the peach tree all of a sudden. If you uproot the oak tree and put a peach tree instead, it didn't develop anything. You cut something down and place it in something. Development of doctrine means it has to retain the same roots, it has to be what it always was. Now you can grow understanding, you can grow in depth, you can grow, you you can't stop being what it was. Now, when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to the truth of Christ, when did Revelation happen? That'd be the the one past apostle night. Perfect. Good. That's the who who is John. Yes. So it's that John died, Revelation ends. You can turn everything. So, it's, so it, the development then is not going to be what God tells us. Uh, up until that point, it could be a bit of that. You know, God told us new things. 
God's pulling us out. Development is not going to be in the dock, it's going to be in my understanding of God. In my grasp of it, where I'm applying it. Development doesn't take place with God revelation. It takes place in us. Is that see that's a very important distinction? And so now he's going to talk about because he completely will say, oh, doctrine developed. Meaning, you know, really that place something else. We used to say, you know, that abortion was wrong, but now developed doctrine. So now we know, well, you need to have money. Your place for Christ taught with your own teaching. So by understanding you well, I can grasp it in new ways, I can say it perhaps in clear language, I can use new expressions, all that's proper about it. And it must be what was taught at the beginning and was always been taught. Or it's not development, it's replacement. Now, John II says this occurs not only in the truth of faith, who Christ is, who the church is, the sacraments there are, but it's going to occur with moral theology as well. What's right and wrong? How do I live? How do I behave? And so, yes, new questions might happen, but they weren't, weren't calling critical own people at the time of Christ. New question. So it has to be some development. How do I, how do I figure out what's good or bad? Let's go back to what you know, was taught us. Human beings have a particular dignity. Marriage and human sexuality is a dignity and a value. You know, and that's what we play with us. And the usual side of marriage is way to that and harmful to us. Therefore, to try to create human life outside of the dignity of marriage, offense marriage, harms the children, harms the family or ourselves. So it's developed, but not changed. That makes sense? <clears throat> Questions? The church is moral reflection, always conducted in the light of Christ, the teacher, is also developed a specific form of theological science called moral theology. A science that accepts and examines the divine relation, on the same time responding to the magic of human reason. Because new questions arise. You know, for instance, a question of moral theology would be. This collagen or bio from bovine species acceptable from the that's not that's not the scriptures. They weren't they weren't they weren't extracting collagen back and they protein extracts. It's a good question. So we have to figure the human reason has to be involved to figure out what is the core of, of what's being taught here. Is it good or bad to do this or not? Moral theology is a reflection concerning Concerning morality, good evil to an act, or the person who forms it. In this sense, it's open to all people. But it's also a theology, in as much as the knowledge of the origin of the end of moral action is found that the one is good. The giving himself to man Christ, while from the happiness of moral life. So, moral theology, in other words, is very language and scripture. So, morality is. Man's choices and the person who does it. Theology is how does this relate to God? And so moral theology is then how does what I act and, and live bring me to God or separate me from God? That's what moral theology is supposed to be. Second man counsels invited scholars to take special care of the renewal of moral theology. In such a way that the scientific presentation, increasingly based on the teaching of Scripture, will cast light on the exalted vocation of faith or Christ, on obligation to bear through the charity of life in the world. So you reflect in new ways to do new things, but begin here. Don't begin in here or had this brilliant idea the other day, had a dream, or whatever it might be. You begin in the scripture, you begin with Christ. Because we're disciples of Christ, not disciples of Freud, or disciples of.
The council also encouraged theologians by respecting the methods and requirements of course of science to look for a more appropriate way of communicating doctrine to people of their time. There is a difference between the deposit of the truth of faith and the manner in which they are expressed, keeping the same, meaning the same judgment. That to further imitation will extend it to all the faithful, but address the lows in particular. The faithful should live in the closest contact with others over their time, to work for perfect understanding of the modes of thought and once expressed in their culture. So we'll lock in this few sentences. Um, so what's being encouraged is yes, go back to the beginning, look at what's, what's being taught, but also it's true, the truth doesn't change, but the people need new things. You don't teach high school the way you teach third graders, or you're not going to bring up high schools, or very third graders. You don't teach adults the way you teach kindergartners. I'm not coming here and saying, hey guys, let's go and kind of fix things, let's get the other pictures, and <laughs> well, maybe you like that, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll maybe we slightly fool that, but probably not. <laughs> so the way so you live in a world that the new questions arise. We're different ages, different times, different places, but in the concern with different things. So 50 years ago, the questions of marriage wasn't a big wasn't a big question. Everyone knew whether you were atheist or Jewish or Hindu. Now everyone was confused. Whether you're Christian or Catholic, everyone was in the public. And so it's been a deeper focus on the questions and the needs of the particular people. It was not about finding new things to say, but saying, how can I help the people best who are in front of me? What new new technologies can be helpful? Like the apps on our cell phones. What new things can be done to express things in our lives? Are there, are there going to be new analogies, new stories, new ways to approach people that will be helpful to our time? And and then finally, what it's saying is that one of the great sources of renewal is going to be from ordinary quote order of people. We live in a world that hates this in ordinary grammatical law. We live in a world that says you have to be extraordinary in some way to matter. You have to be special in some way. But God came down as ordinary. Christ lived in ordinary town, ordinary village, in ordinary things. The greatest saints to ever live were a housewife and a carpenter, blue collar worker. And a, sink, and, a, and a mom with one child. The greatest saints ever lived. If you ask the contemporaries what they do, they were going they, they to write books, they didn't work miracles, they didn't preach, they were going to have great advanced degrees or great works of art. They lived a simple, ordinary, humble life. We forget that. And so it's not that we're called to hide from the culture, we're called to transform the culture. And to find ways to, to, to bring Christ to the culture. And that's going to be done in a special way by the land. As a priest, my job is to the sacraments. My, I, should, I should be a little removed from the culture. I should be living in there, you know, in a little different way. Say Mass daily and your confessions, all those things. I'm not supposed to be going out and, and working in the mines or the you know, the gas station, the store, or whatever it might be. Um, I don't raise a family. But when you do, all the things you're doing in your ordinary life, that should be Christ. To your friends, to your family, to your work, to your hobbies, to the entertainment. You know, so the people in Hollywood or Catholic should be Christ all of them. Or the writer should be Christ to the, to the, to the readers. People who are at their job in Christ whether you're a sweet streeper or you can barbers or teach in the school, to be able to bring Christ in various ways for people around you. That's what I was talking about. That's not high. I'm not saying we're going to go hide in a box on the stairs. We're going to want to bring the world to Christ and Christ's Lord. The work of many theologians, we jump on the seconds to start up the conference. And then he's going to go and tear us into the department. They start the conference. There are many theologians who found support in the council of courage. There's already one fruit. Interesting health reflections of the truths that they believe to apply to life. Reflections often in a better form suited to sensitivities and questions of our contemporaries. We say it's wonderful. We've seen this great, great fruit. These great theologians who don't ask, the double things. Go there. 
The church, particularly the bishops, whom Jesus Christ primarily entrusted with the ministry of teaching, appreciate this work very much and encourage those who continue their efforts. It's about to find an authentic pure of words within the wisdom. So he says, I know that I think you guys are out there, you're doing great work, you need to do what you're doing, I know you're being faithful to Christ. He's setting up stuff now for the yell come later, especially starting with this wisdom. So, you know, you can teach someone, you should start with all the confidence that you slap them to the left. Just. At the same time, <laughs> there's a lot here, as I say, see you say However, <laughs> good job, everyone, except for you jerks. Yeah, then now we're done, let us see anything else. At the same time, however, then the context, the thoughts, the debates which follow the council. They've developed a certain interpretation of Christian morality which are not consistent with sound teaching. They're unsound teaching, they're foolish, they're stupid. A couple of seconds since they've been a nicer way than I have. <laughs> the way he's the same. Certainly, the church magisterium does not tend to impose upon the faithful a particular system, a less philosophical one. Nevertheless, in order to reverently preserve and faithfully expound the word of God, May share in the due to state of some trend of philosophical thinking and certain philosophical innovations are not compatible with human truth. In other words, no one has to be a Thomas. No one has to be a follower of the world. No one has to be, you can be a Scotus, you can, you can follow John Scotus rather than Thomas Aquinas. You can like the Lurie, or you can like um, uh, other more You don't have to say you're all this, say one, not trying to do that. They could be others. You have to follow the gospel. You have to follow the gospel. Well, that's why I told my dad. The U.S. Supreme Court last year took away the federal rights of federal prisoners to kill their cases. Now, he's a state people who can take it for 25 years as far as on the Kentucky State Police. So I wrote him about that one. He came back and said everybody he arrested was guilty. So he goes along with the U.S. Supreme Court on this one. So I had to think about how to write that back. So I used Sodom and Gomorrah when. God was taking Abram into Sodom and Gomorrah, he can kill everybody. And Abram says, if there's 30 innocent ones, then we kill the 30 innocent ones. And God does the one innocent one. And then I use the state of Illinois, 15 men said, no, on death row, claiming they were innocent, and the DNA was just coming out. So the governor gives up paper, 15 years old, and 10 men said, on death row, were innocent, didn't do the crimes. So he abolished. The death penalty is said to go north on that one. And that's, I don't even care about people dying. Thanks, Dad. But I changed his mind, too. That not everybody sitting in prison is guilty. There's an innocent one sitting in there, according to the DNA stuff now. You see it every day. I put it on Twitter every day because Facebook is mad me when I do. I'm on on Facebook. Facebook channel? Yeah, I did. I did it up three times. <laughs> so now I just do all the pretty stuff on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Article three. And addressing this encyclical letter to that to you and other bishops, is my head to state the principle necessary for discerning what's contrary to sound off. Drawing attention to the elements that turn world teaching today appear particularly exposed to error, ambiguity or neglect. In other words, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to pull out every single philosopher, every single theologian. I'm going to give principles. You know, these things, you're going to know what's bad. If you know, know that, you know, they're supposed to be red, white, and blue on the flag, as long as it's the green flag or a purple flag, you know it's wrong. It doesn't matter what color the flag is, if it's not red, white, and blue, it's not the right flag. Um, and so, the same way, you know, the truth is going to be, you, know, you can discern it for yourself and stop it at the local level rather than waiting for it to grow or to be more confusing. These very elements, these are the very elements which to depend as the answer to the experimental the human condition, which today also is in the past, found in the so human heart. For example, what is man? What's the meaning and purpose of our life? What is good and what is sin? 
What's the origin and purpose of suffering? What's the way to attain true happiness? What are death, judgment, and punishment after death? Lastly, what is the final unutterable mystery which embraces our lives, from which we take our origin, where we pretend? These other questions, such as what is freedom? What's the freedom relationship to the pain of God's law? What's the whole conscience of man's moral development? How do we determine the court and the truth of the truth about the good, the specific rights, and duties of the human person? All these questions can be summed up in the question of the young man who walked to Christ. Teacher was good as they had to have eternal life. All of those questions are summed up in how do we go to heaven? Because the church was sent by Jesus to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Each of them to observe, observe all of these men. The day she once more this for the max reply. A reply that possesses the mind and the power capable of answering the most controversial and complex questions. Don't be afraid of questions. Don't be afraid of entering into debates. You have the answer. You don't have to wander and say, I don't know that. No, you have the answer. And so when people say things that are stupid or obscure or confusing or difficult or painful, don't lie to them, say, I don't know. Because we do know. You've been told the answer, and the, the duty is to the answer. The light and power also impel the church constantly to carry out not only her dogmatic, but also more reflection in its very context. It's very necessary for these missions. Who's he's talking about? It is not simply a matter of repeating the same answer, but to go back and say, there are better ways to say this. There are better ways to express it. So there are better ways to be proven, you know, through the science of things one, or through being, because a good psychology is going to support moral theology. You know, if you do bad things, you're going to make yourself go crazy. Right? You tell lies, you're going to end up not only able to trust people. If you I mean, you see in our culture that people don't live good lives, they end up in mental illnesses. So a good psychology is going to also help support the fact that living and living a, a truth and a holy way is a good thing. And so they support each other. Um, and so don't be afraid of the disciplines and those sciences, but use them in the Christ for the trouble of the Is this the same line of power, the Christ power, Christ truth, Christ guidance? The church's magisterium continues to carry out its task in the sermon. What's good, what's bad, what's true, what conforms to Christ, what is the way of Christ? Accepting and living out this admonition addressed to thee by the Apostle Paul Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, the one who is judged for the living of the dead, and by his appearance and by his kingdom. Preach the word. You are in season out of sin. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. Be unfailing in patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not endure sound teaching. That in itching years will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own likings. They will turn away from listening to the truth and honor events. But as for you, be steady always, endure suffering, work with the evangelists, fill your ministry. He said that. <laughs> this was thirty years ago. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's people are just different these days. That's a quote from Tim. Yes. Uh, from two thousand years ago. That years ago, and yeah, you know, people don't change much, do they? People prefer a lot of people. It's, G. K. Chesterton is a quote where he said, "I don't like church tumble and right." I'm a church that's so humble when I'm wrong. There's no one wrong. If all I'm looking for the church to say everything you're saying is perfect, everything you're saying is right, everything you're saying is wonderful, you're fine, why am I in church? I know I'm wonderful, I'm fine, I'm not right. <laughs> I need to have help, I'm not wonderful, I'm not fine, I'm not right. And so we need, so again, what we're being reminded of here is that. We have a goal, we have a purpose, 
and not to be afraid to speak these things, not to be afraid to teach these things. Thirty-one. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The human nation was frequently invaded, and differently resolved in temporary moral reflection are all closely related. And in various ways, the crucial issue of human freedom. What are my rights? What am I free? Don't impose your stuff upon me. This hasn't changed. This is something we we'll, we'll look all, all the the transsexualism of what we can really think that we're seeing with the well, the if I identify as a woman, I should be able to play in women's sports, build the blank. All these things we're seeing now, <laughs> human freedom. People today certainly have a particularly strong sense of freedom. As the Kabbalah's declaration on human freedom, they mean the Shemai, they mean the Indian of humanity, when you observe, the Indian of the human person is a concern which people of our time are increasingly more aware. Hence, there is the this is a demand in our culture, in our time, and our place, people be allowed to enjoy the use of their responsible for their freedom. Decide their, their actions around doing conscience. That's no pressure or coercion. Especially we see this in the right to religious freedom, to respect the conscience, on a journey towards the truth which precedes the nation and the rights of the person. And this is part of the reason why you have some of the, these, these confusions of. Well, but if somebody else is, is Hindu or, or, or is Protestant or is Muslim, aren't I going to be using their freedom to tell them Christ is the truth? And Christ says, don't do A, B, or C. So this is, it's, a, it's a question, a tension. The heightened sense, the dignity of the human person. Well, let me, let me stop back up. We give you a quick answer for the two adult access. We'll leave it there. If it's true, it is, that everybody is made for the same purpose, the same happiness, the same goal. Ultimately, you're doing the people the most good to speak the truth. As you're treating people with the true dignity that I only have, you tell them the truth. In that particular context, I am free. To go out and jump off my roof and say, well, this blanket could act as a parachute. I'm free to do that. There's no law against it. <laughs> but when you tell me, whoa, 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 Father, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's not going to catch you. You're going to hurt yourself. If you saw me standing in the middle of the road, when you, when you stop me and say, whoa, let me get it back in my way. Oh, but I'm invincible. I, I took, I took this special spring water, and now, and now the truck's not going to hurt me. It's going to bounce off. You would pull me back. You would say, oh, well, okay, that, that's, that's your freedom. No one would, any, other, any other context except for religion and morality, no one would think about these things. I have the right to, to stand fast and say, you know what? 2 plus 2 is 75. But you correct me. <laughs> yes, I have the right to say that. Fine. <laughs> but I'm still wrong. <laughs> When it comes to moral truth, when it comes to morality, when it comes to the right way, you should have the same ability and the same respect for the human person. In the same way that telling me, correcting me that, that no, two plus two is not equal to seven five, or that I can't go out of traffic and drink spring water, that's not bending my dignity. That's upholding my dignity. That's actually treating me in a proper way. Whereas to say, well, I guess these people walk in the traffic, we'll have a funeral next week, I guess. That's not respecting her. It's just as true when it comes to religion and what's right and wrong. Because these things in the end will harm me, affect me, and perhaps them to hell. But let's see what John the second answer the question. <laughs> that was my answer. 32. Oh, sorry, um, we'll put a above. This heightened sense of dignity of the human person and his recurring weakness. Of the respect due to the journey of conscience certainly represents what a positive achievement in modern culture. Not a bad thing to say people deserve these things. You should have forced the cat in some of the neck and say you're going to be baptized. Go. Mm -hmm. Not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because then you're not really helping. You're not having a change. This perception, authentic as it is, has been expressed in a number, number of more 
from us out of the way. And some of these do diverge from the truth about matter and creature, the image of God. These be corrected and purified by the faith. So yes, you have a conscience, but careful what you say. What do you do about it? Thirty-two. Certain currents of modern thought have come on so far to dissolve freedom to such an extent it's become an absolute. So the truth is, is absolute; it's unfree, and that's most important. And then freedom becomes a source of value. Not good, not bad, not what's best for me, not God, but I'm free. This is the direction taken by doctrine, which has lost the sense of the sense of the transcendent. God is above all things, God is beyond all things. Out of which are explicitly the atheists. The individual conscience, the core of the status of the supreme tribunal of moral judgment, which hands down categorical and that lost decision about good meaning. The affirmation that one has a duty to follow one's conscience, the duly added the affirmation that one's moral judgment is true because of the fact it has origin in the conscience. But in this way, the inescapable claim of truth disappeared, giving their place to appear sincerity, authenticity, and being a piece of oneself. So much so that some of them come to adopt a radically subjectivistic conception of moral judgment. Translation, fellow translators. What's being said? People are becoming their own gods. They're becoming their own gods. <laughs> That's the way Yeah. <coughs> Making their conscience into God, whatever, whatever I think is right. You have your truth, I have my yeah. truth. <laughs> so, so, what are the conscience? Because you get to, yeah, I think we're so used, used to the Pinocchio with the blue cricket, Game of and the angels holding the door. We kind of think of it as a, a faculty or a thing, an object, a little person, a little voice. But it's all conscience. Conscience is a action, we say a skill. But this is much harder to represent in the cartoon. <laughs> Conscience is a judgment, an act of judgment. What you're doing when you exercise your conscience is you are comparing two things. You're comparing judging, you're comparing what you're about to do, my action, or what I have already done, to an objective standard. Does this match up with that? Ultimately, it should be Christ, it should be Christ teaching what's good or bad. So I am thinking about punching, you know, Stephen the Nuns. Well, if Christ says, don't punch Stephen the Nuns, therefore, my conscience tells me I cannot punch Stephen the Nuns. My act in this case <laughs> is, not, is not going to correspond well to the objective standard of Christ. Objective meaning. How it's silent. Unchanging. <clears throat> What's truth? So it is true, I must always follow my conscience. Right? Because, because if, I, if my conscience lets me know, is my action good or bad? And so if I, if, if I think to myself, well, I know that I should have punched you, but anyway. anyway my conscience, that's a bad thing. The problem is, is that people these days don't take this out. And they say, this is what I'm judging. So it becomes comparing my action to my thoughts. My action to what I want to do. My action to what feels good. They're not comparing anything. It's no comparison. And so they've gone from this to follow your conscience because it's what leads you to know rightly what's good and bad, to follow your conscience means I feel like doing this. And I'm okay with it, therefore it must be good. I'm being authentic. I'm being true to myself. This is what I feel that I should be doing. And then where does that lead? It leads to there being no right or wrong. My true, your truth, good or bad. 
And so the, the Pope is saying, yes, by your conscience, you know what that means. Understand that it has to be a, a proper conscience, not simply my action, which I like it all. Because, yeah, there are plenty of times where what I want to do, my conscience says, don't do those things. No, don't go and, you know, yell at people. Don't go and speed. Don't put them on. Don't do those particular sins. As opposed to, oh, yeah, that, that sounds fun. Oh, yeah, that sounds, you know, what? they deserve to hear that from me. So it goes from an objective standard to a tautology. To a, to a subjective one, right? And the personal, so I personally feel, yeah, think about you. Yeah. Um, because I take out the better standard. There's no, it's not really a comparison. What I'm judging is my action compared to my feelings. My action compared to what I want to do. And, and so, so people will say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but the mean is, I follow what feels good to me. <laughs> because they're not comparing it to any objective that's by themselves, because the status stand is by themselves. What they're saying, the little voice in my head told me, it's okay, you can punch me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got that title in it. I follow the conscience. So that's what the voice in your head sounds like? Yours doesn't. It's a black man, it's a black style, it's a black style, it's a black style, it's a black style. Right. <laughs> That's what I think about those two of the two side panels on the altar. One of them is black and the other one is white. And so I'm always like <laughs> That's Bernard that's Benedict. Who are they? The two, the two people on the side panel. Saint Bernard Saint Benedict. Okay. I just don't think we're They're not the shoulder angel shoulder either. <laughs> claims that pigs have more rights than they human fetuses. Because they can feel it. Of course, so with human fetuses, we don't think it's that. That's a different question. But, I mean, but yeah, you know, people who literally say, you know, you know, this ape in the forest, or that pig or that horse, 
that should have more rights than you know a handicapped person, a wheeled person, or a film blank. My question is what happens when you're sleeping? I feel that. Watch your doors, people. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you're sleeping, you can't your eyes, you know, the reason not the exercise. You're sleeping is the same thing as being in a coma. So at that point, why not? Well, I, mean, I think we think you know why not. I don't think they can argue why not. Yeah. As is immediately evident, this crisis of truth is not is not connected to this development. So there's, there's now only a crisis of freedom and a crisis of truth in the other. Once the idea of a universal truth about the good is the noble to human reason is lost, and then the notion of conscience also changes. So as soon as I stop being willing to admit there's one truth for all peoples, well, the ones I call is judging, it's judging myself. Conscience is the longest of his, his first reality, is an act, an act, of a person's intelligence, the body is to apply the universal laws of good to the situation. So apply this to my specific place. And thus, which is a judgment about the right conduct we show from here and now. Then there's a tendency to grant the individual the conscience, the judge brought it in, independently determined to be of the meaning, and acting accordingly. So my conscience tells me it's good and bad. Not the objective truth of what's real, who God is, and who Christ is. My conscience says, punching Steve in the nose is okay, because Steve was a jerk. So I'm going to be attentive to myself and punch Steve in the nose. Awfully convenient, doesn't it? Unless, unless he does something nice, and then your feelings will change toward him, so then you. <laughs> but I'm still being so attentive to myself. Yeah, you're pretty rough at it at the moment. Such an outlook is quite congenial to an individual's ethic, whereby each individual is faced with his own truth, the truth of his own others. Taken from the extreme consequences, the individualism is the denial of the very of human nature. So every one of us has our own truth. We're not all the same thing. We're not human beings. You're first of all different, you have a different truth than me, different reality than me, but we're not human beings. I am, that's to you. <laughs> Here's something else. I'm called sapiens, you're called quasi sapiens. Is that why I'm so short? Is that why I'm so short? That's right. <laughs> the clearly height makes you important. <laughs> So you're saying you don't follow, you don't follow that, uh, <laughs> that question of reports of value. Right. I don't think you'd like that idea of value. I need to start walking around with those shoes, so I'm really not sure. <laughs> you want to wear heels then? Uh, I do have a pair of foreign shoes, I can't wear them anymore, but they make sure you're very tall. <laughs> On roller skates too. That's yeah. very tall. <laughs> <laughs> These different notions of the origin of the of thought was the radical position between moral law and conscience, nature of freedom. So the problem with these things is they sound very nice in the short term. They're very helpful in making excuses for why it's okay that I do film like. Well, it's okay that I sleep around because I think in this case it's okay. Because guess what? Suit is really hot. Therefore, it must be okay. Is <laughs> that the old police song? Is that the the forties? That's the seventies. 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 That's the you get right, and they all look at me like I was crazy. And I said, Church teaches you responsibility. You're doing your conscience, you're doing your actions, but what your actions get you into. Right. Yeah, that's false freedom, yeah. individual conscience, 
individuality, and, and people teach these things. It's really sad, like the United States is kind of what made people be allowed to follow this, mm -hmm. but the United States is also the reason why everyone's on Congress. Because everybody's making freedom into whatever the hell they want to be. Right. Like, yeah. It's license. Yeah. It's not yeah. license. Yeah, it's license. It's, it's, it's terrible. The wind and the apple have to fly. But by themselves, they don't want to live. You know, the problem is we're taking freedom outside of purpose and context. And we're trying to fly without an engine and without the rest of the plane. And it don't work for it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, the reason why John Paul is very concerned about this because it you know, leads to tremendous misery you know, with the drug addiction or the filling of addiction to destruction of families. It's all the, all the divorce. What happens with divorce cases? People say, well, well, I don't feel free to be myself around this person. You know, this is, you know, they're stifling my freedom. I can, you know, whatever. And then people, you know, with these terrible tragedies and bad ones, where children don't, don't understand them. I've really met children, knowing that the marriage was last forever. Just because they haven't seen them. They'll, then they have to go self work because, well, I'm down, they'll be enough to stay together. And they don't, they don't think any human beings, don't trust human beings. I've talked to people whose just kids are scared of marriage because they see all the around them as divorced. And so they're terrified, and then they're terrified by the, of a married life, terrified all kinds of things, because everyone's around them says it's impossible because of human freedom. There, there's a tyranny now of freedom. Isn't this a matter of ironic? Number 33. Side by side, the exaltation <coughs> are they contrast with it? Modern culture is asking the question of the very existence of uh, the existence of history. A number of disciplines grouped together in the name of behavioral sciences that rightly draw attention to many kinds of psychological and social conditioning because of human freedom. But is there a real free will? Well, certain kinds of science will say, no, it's all just animal and You're all just products of your culture, your environment, your upbringing, and your own life. All of these conditionings the study that they receive are present important achievements, which have application in various areas. For example, teaching or administration of justice. But these people, some people, are going on the conclusion which can be legally drawn from the question of even the reality and freedom. So there are people who will say, you know, that ultimately everything can be answered by mechanical you know, impulses of your brain or what you feel like the moment. There's not really any real choices going on, we're just complicated ethics. At the same time, we'll say, but we have freedom in every one. So we're just complicated ethics. So there's no free will. If there's free will, I have responsibility. If I have responsibility, I can't act the way I want to act. Therefore, I'm just complicated animal. But we do it right And it could also be made here of the theory of misuse, scientific. Research human person. Apart from the big variety of customs, behavioral patterns, and institutions present in the these theories end up drawn out of denial from the universal values, at least with a conception of morality. So they'll say, well, we, well look at all the kind of places around the world, from places if you had you know, misogynist, people you had places if you had polygamy, places you had things you had. Therefore, it's just, it's just all this doesn't matter, so nothing inherent to human beings about it. Well, you know, the fact that two men marry, or one marry, or three women marry, or, you know, it's all the same. Because it's all the different any places. The fact is people can mess up in lots of places, right? Because just because people steal, does it make stealing okay. Because people lie, does it make lying okay. So yes, you find different places and calls that, that accept these things differently. Right? There were places and times if you were leaving your hand cut off. That's not, you know, Stealing is not accepted in those cultures, no matter how other places where it was kind of was less, less, less held. You can't say there for humans that's that deep is okay as long as only come. We do these things. 34. 
Teacher, what good must do to have eternal life? The question of morality, which Christ provides the answer, Christ's own being, Christ's own person, being a fellow of Christ, cannot ignore the question of freedom. Indeed, this question is central. There is no morality without freedom. It's only in freedom that man can determine what is good. What sort of freedom? The Catholic consider our contemporary and present regard of freedom, and pursue it assiduously with zeal. Do you often call it wrong ways license to anything that pleases and evil? Speaks of a genuine freedom. Genuine freedom is an outstanding manifestation of the divine vision of man. For God will to leave man the power of his own counsel, so we see his creator of his own accord, that we truly arrive at full and blessed perfection by pleasing to God. Although each individual does have the right to respect his own journey in search of the truth, there exists a prior obligation, and a great one of that to seek the truth to adhere to it when it's known. As Carl John Henry Newman, the Italian defender of the rights of conscience, forcefully said, Conscience has rights because of his duties. Certain tendencies in contemporary archaeology have influenced the current subjectivism, of individualism, and dismantling. Involve not with the pertains of relationship and freedom to moral law, human nature, and conscience. They impose all criteria for the moral evaluation of acts. Despite that variety, these tendencies are one less, or one less, or even as nine of the dependence of freedom on truth. If you wish to acknowledge and undertake a critical discernment of these tendencies, a sermon capable of acknowledging what is legitimate, useful, and valuable, at the same time pointing at their ambiguity and beauty, saying as errors, as to examine them in light of fundamental dependence on freedom, upon truth. This theorist, authoritative expression of words of Christ. We know the truth, the truth is set you free. In the end, freedom and truth have to go together. I have to live freedom according to what's true. According to what's true, who I am, or what I'm wrong, who does. If there's not an objective truth bigger than me, beyond me, greater than me, my freedom will lead to great misery. My stuff will run. What is the purpose of the quick? What is free will? Why does God give it to us? So you can choose him. So you can choose him? Not only really choose, but love. There is no love without choice, I would say. No love without choice. Yeah. It's not freedom. Absolutely. Um, so, so this thing is necessary for us. This is not a bad thing. God gives us free will, gives us choice, so lets us choose him, so we can be his children, so we can love him, so we can be his friends. Without this free will, this freedom, there is no friendship with God. That's just why you can't force something. Because you're taking away their, their love for God. However, <clears throat> free will has the duty and the purpose of love and serving God. And so for someone is choosing against God's love, against who God is, against what's real, they are abusing it. They're taking something that was meant for a purpose and using it in the wrong way. My shoes aren't to help me walk in place I can walk my bare feet. But I can use it to smack people on the head from the face. <laughs> I can't say, well, this is the shoe, which is this, is this the shoe has a good use for it. Well, no. The shoe's purpose is to help me walk. I'm not going to make across the face. My freedom is to help us to take a love, not for the sake of hatred, or for the sake of harm, or for the sake of the fill of life. And so this is a good thing. But in order to do the right thing, it must be founded on truth. Because my freedom has a purpose. To lead me to the truth, to walk in the truth, and to come out living a particular way. The purpose isn't so I can choose whatever I want. Freedom is not a dial that I can strip back and forth and say, well, I'm going to choose bad and choose good. Freedom is a tool to help me Hear the truth, cling to it, and come to God as a best friend. So, any other use of this is harmful to myself and those around me. 
So if we begin with the freedom to say, I'm here to choose, but there's no truth involved, there's no going beyond myself to involve, there's nothing real that's involved. My freedom ends up that simply begin the tautology, run around circles, harmful to myself as well. It's not going to free. Good. Questions, comments? I guess if uh, we didn't choose, God would have a bunch of people with Stockholm Syndrome. We'd be like forced to love him. <laughs> well, I mean, it's strange. more than that, I, I would say, I would say we, we'd be a bunch of animals. This desk, this bubble, will never disobey any of God's laws. It's 100% of all of God's laws. Lost. It can't be God's plan to try and move over. It just is. And if, if this without freedom, this will be a Stockholm syndrome or you know, just a lump of material other animals. Yeah. So it's a big deal. We have to, in order to express and talk about and explain to people, we have to be in the state of, yeah, the freedom, freedom is good. Absolutely. It's not that we want to say people who freedom is bad or freedom. No, no, freedom's right. I want you to be free. So your freedom has to be found on truth, or you feel like hurting yourself. There's lots of things which can be found on truth, right? It's good that you can eat. But if you eat without foundation on truth, you know, yeah. I know it says this calories, but my truth is no calories. <laughs> I know that it says that. Well, guess what's going to happen to me? It's not going to be good for me. I don't know what But I don't believe there's calories in there. My truth is no calories. Well, there's an old saying. God always forgives. Man sometimes forgives. Nature never forgives. <laughs> Alright, it's five o'clock. Let's... And here, and those who are going on safe journeys and happy dinner. And those who are staying here, um, see safe journeys and see you next. That's really great. Don't fall between here and there. <laughs> and the freedom to do so will be good for you. Right. Just going to see you open the door. Son of the Holy Spirit. Mom, we're going to record and care for this. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of human freedom and truth. May we live in this truth and follow your Son. Understand what you've given us, the tools you've shown to us. May we follow your Son, Jesus, here on earth, and live in forever in heaven. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.